Good evening. In the last lectures, we have dealt with the society in Italy during the 7th century. Today, and in the next two lectures, we will no longer delve into the lives of medieval communities. Um, we shall leave the Italian peninsula and move to the east of the Mediterranean in order to follow events which interested very large areas and had long-lasting repercussions, very visible even today. In fact, the lecture of today is an excursus that will allow us a better understanding of the Middle Ages. In order to move east, we need to talk about the Byzantine Empire. In the fifth lecture of this cycle, we have seen Justinian's restoration design. He seemed to have accomplished this plan, at least from the military point of view. For a few years, he had regained the control of the Mediterranean coasts and made the sea look again like a Roman lake. However, the war effort had contributed to a financial crisis which became eventually a military one, since the empire's supremacy relied upon mercenary troops. By the end of the 6th century, the Byzantine army, in spite of the experience of its commanders, of its technical capabilities and of its great traditions, was struggling to contain enemies on all sides. After the death of Justinian in 565, huge territories had been rapidly lost in Spain and in Italy, whilst the control of northern African coasts required fighting against an obstinate local guerrilla in the areas once controlled by the Vandals. Only from the point of view of the naval supremacy, which is no small thing, the Byzantine continued to dominate the Mediterranean. The situation in the Balkan Peninsula was also very worrying. For many years already, peoples of different origins had been populating the Balkans. The Asiatic Avars, the Scandinavian Gepids, the Slavs and the Bulgars, who were a Turkish people originally roaming the Caspian steppes. These peoples had different customs and spoke different languages, but the gap that separated them from the inhabitants of the Mediterranean shores was much wider. And precisely towards the Mediterranean, these nomadic, literal people were converging through the huge funnel of the Balkan Peninsula. Not less serious was the threat of the Sassanians, the aggressive eastern neighbors of the Byzantines. They had already forced Justinian to endure long wars, to suffer territorial losses, to pay huge amounts in exchange for peace, for the peace he needed for his campaign in Africa and in Italy. With Justinian's successor, however, the war with the Persian broke out again in 570. The conflict for the control of Armenia, which included the northeastern part of what is now Turkey, lasted for about 20 years until a Greek Byzantine general, Morris, defeated the Sassanian armies. Drawn into the imperial family by a strategic marriage, Morris became emperor in 582. He was a skilled administrator, apart from being a great general. On top of that, he achieved a major diplomatic success. After defeating the Sassanian, Sassanian Empire and throwing it into a period of political unrest, um, uh, Morris helped Khosrow II to regain the throne, usurped by a rebellious general. In return for that, Khosrow signed a treaty in force of which the Byzantine recovered Armenia and the western part of what is now Georgia. The friendship with the Persian monarch allowed Morris to deal with the situation in the Balkan Peninsula, where the pressure of Avars and Slavs was mounting. Morris was a commander of great experience. To him, or at least to his entourage, is attributed the most important product of the Byzantine military science ever, the Strategicon, a manual on 
work conduct of great completeness and insight, recently rediscovered and revaluated. So, during the last decade of the 6th century, Morris devoted himself to the conflict in the Balkans. He achieved several victories. However, the protection of the vast peninsula required the destruction of ever and Slav forces north of the Danube. It was a difficult and costly war conducted under adverse demographic circumstances and it imposed a strict public spending policy which eventually made the emperor unpopular both with the troops and in Constantinople. Therefore, after ten years of tiresome war in the Balkans, an imperial order to the troop to winter once more in the hostile territories north of the Danube sparked a military uprising. Soon, a man called Phocas, a simple centurion of the troops deployed in the Balkans, was leading rebellious unit marching back towards Constantinople. The Byzantine capital was impregnable. But, as the insurgent army approached, a city riot induced Morris to flee and seek refuge in the nearby city of Chalcedonia. Phocas entered Constantinople and he was proclaimed emperor with the Senate's approval. Shortly thereafter, Morris was arrested in the church where he had been sheltered and then killed after having been forced to witness the execution of his many sons in the year 602. This was the tragic end of Justinian's dynasty. The military uprising and the assassination of the emperor were sinister reminders of the evidence that had caused the decadence of the Western Empire. An ominous signs of the new century, Phocas started a reign of terror. His rule plunged the empire into a spiral of conspiracies and bloody crackdowns, which targeted especially the aristocracy, but also the monophysites, the Jews and other religious minorities. Soon hated throughout the empire, Phocas only kept a good relationship with the church in Rome. In this respect, it is something that will later have important consequences for Italy. As we have seen in Lecture 6, the Byzantine emperors used to regard the Pope as one of the five patriarchs in charge for the Christian ecumeny. The other ones were in Constantinople, Antiochia, Jerusalem and Alexandria. They were supposed to agree on matters of faith and considered almost as subordinates to the emperor. In 607, however, Focus acknowledged the primacy of the Church of Rome on the other churches. If you have had the chance to visit the Roman Forum, you might remember a column dedicated to Focus standing high amid the ruins. It had been part of a much more ancient building, but it was erected again at the beginning of the 7th century to honor this unworthy emperor. We will come back in another lecture on the consequences of Focus decisions. More important for us now is the fact that in 603 the war with the Sassanid Empire restarted after the assassination of Morris. Hosro II considered Morris uh, his benefactor and he had even married one of his daughters. The murder of Morris offered him a pretext for regaining the vast territories he had surrendered in exchange for Morris' help. This new war will last for nearly 30 years. Soon, the Persian troops advanced deeply into Byzantine territories. Phocas soon lost all the territories that Morris had gained in exchange for his help to Carl. To Hosro. A Persian division even managed to reach Chalcedonia, a suburb of Constantinople. In the meantime, Avar and Slavic hordes were flooding the Balkan Peninsula from the Adriatic Sea to eastern Thrace. By the year 610, the Roman Byzantine Empire was on the verge of collapse. It was then that the Exarch of Afri Africa, 
Heraclius decided to act by inspiring a rebellion against Phocas. From his city, Carthage, with the support of the rich province of Egypt, he sent a fleet towards Constantinople under the command of his own son, also named Heraclius. The young Heraclius was greeted everywhere as a liberator. When his fleet arrived in Constantinople, he was proclaimed emperor, while the tyrant was deposed and executed. Heraclius had to deal with an appalling situation, both from the economic and the military point of view. Having gained an empire already invaded by enemies, he became one of the greatest Byzantine emperors. Let us now have a look at his formidable enemies. To the east of the empire, Persia had become, a, under the Sassanid dynasty, a superpower, as it had been 1,000 years before under the Achaemenid kings. The founder of the Sassanid empire had been Artashir, who in 224 AD had overthrown the Parthian domination of Persia. With the Sassanid kings, the organization of the state became stronger and more centralized, the foreign policy more aggressive. Economically, Persia profited from its position between the Roman Empire on one side and India and the Far East on the other. Gradually, it came to dominate the commerce on the Indian Ocean. On top of that, it had access to the Silk Road, which was becoming more and more important. As you know, the Silk Road is the only passage between the immense uh, natural barriers that divide China from the West, the Tibetan Plateau in the South and the Gobi Desert in the North. The Persians called their country Iran Shah, which literally means Aryan Empire, i.e. Indo-European Empire. Their language belongs in fact to the Indo-European family, although it is written today in Arabic characters. Even today, the language strongly characterizes the people of Iran with respect to the peoples of the Middle East who speak uh, Semitic languages. We, however, refer to the political and religious dimension of the state by using the expression Sassanid or Sassanid in Sassanid Empire. These names derive from the grandfather of Ardashir, Sassan, a priest of the religion founded by Zarathustra and contained in the Avesta, a collection of texts dating probably from the 6th century before Christ, but orally transmitted over many centuries before. In other words, the Zoroastrian religion was probably the first monotheism in history. It had been the fiercest competitor of early Christianism, and it was already more than millenarian at the time of Hosho II. This religion is still practiced today in small communities of India and Iran. It is known also as Mazdaism from the name of Ahura Mazda, the god, the god of justice, of wisdom and of light. Over the four centuries of its existence, the Sassanid Empire had had a few up and downs, of course. However, during the 6th century, a great monarch, Hosro I, had considerably strengthened it by developing agriculture, founding new towns, reforming the administration and the army. He had created land register and a modern system of taxation of land. Although he completely centralized power, uh, Hosro had been tolerant on religious matters, scientific, artistic, musical and literary life flourished. Under the nearly 50 years of his rule, the Sassanid Empire had become a superpower, both from the economic and from the military point of view. The empire's economic and political heart was not in the arid um, Iranian plateau, but in the rich melting pot of Mesopotamia, where Ctesiphon, its cosmopolitan capital, thrived. 
only a few miles from where Baghdad was later founded. At the time of Heraclius, the monarch of the Sassanid Empire was Khosrow II, grandson of the great Khosrow I. His court was a lavish and sophisticated environment in which the works of ancient Greek philosophers were being translated together with the nice legends of the Indian literature. Christian monophysites and historians, as well as Jews, occasionally persecuted in the Eastern Roman Empire, contributed to the cultural life of the capital. The second wife of Hazro was a Christian, and also Christian was his finance minister. Nestorian Christians were sending their missionaries up to China and Sri Lanka. As said, after the assassination of Maurice, Hasro II declared war to the Byzantine Empire. The execution of Phocas did not placate his assiduous aid, nor the repeated proposals of Heraclius to end the war, not even Heraclius' offer to submit to the King of Kings. In one occasion, Hasro executed the diplomats that Heraclius had sent to him. In another case, he replied with an insulting letter. To the west of Constantinople, the situation was equally dire. By settling in Pannonia, the Avers had practically taken the place of Attila's Huns, to whom the people of the Middle Ages equated them. Like the Huns, the Avers were Asian steppes nomads. They lived in symbiosis with their horses and this granted to their armies great mobility and effectiveness in battle. Like the Huns, the Avers made use of the composite bow, a sophisticated weapon made of different materials – horn, wood, sinew, etc. This bow allowed to store more energy when drawn and gave to arrows a greater penetration power. It granted to the Avers a major advantage on their Germanic opponents, who had ordinary wooden bows and were unable to use them while riding. Unlike the Huns, however, the Avers had also developed heavy cavalry units and a capacity to use siege engines. No army and no city was safe from them. By the beginning of the 7th century, they had become the main regional power in the Balkans. From Pannonia, they threatened Italy, the whole Balkan Peninsula and Constantinople. Their supremacy induced other people to join them in plundering a Byzantine city and in enslaving their inhabitants. Among those peoples were the Slavs. They had been pouring into the Balkans from the northeast for quite some time already. They were more numerous than the Avers and tended to settle in the territories they ravaged. With the time, they flooded the whole Balkan Peninsula and eventually replaced almost completely the Latin population who had once played an important role in the Eastern Roman Empire expressing emperors like Justinian. Since the Slavs were able to navigate, not even the Aegean islands were safe from their raids. They reached even Crete at a certain point. The population of Greece had to withdraw into few coastal cities because the Byzantine army had completely lost the control of the main. Today, it might not be easy to imagine the anxiety that such a doomsday situation created in the Eastern Roman Empire. One of the social responses to that anxiety was that the Byzantines rallied around their religion. The empire became less cosmopolitan and more intolerant. People reacted to an existential threat to their society by imagining themselves as the nation elected by God and surrounded by infidels. 
the very last remains of paganism dissolved at that time, both among the urban aristocrats and in the countryside. Jewish communities found themselves in danger. The last remains of the classical civilization vanished in front of the advancing Middle Ages, the ages of holy wars. What had once been the Roman Empire, a melting pot of all faiths and civilization, was rapidly becoming a purely a Greek and Christian nation. When, in the year 610, Heraclius became emperor, the situation of the Roman Empire was so dire that he seriously envisaged transferring the capital to Carthage. Eventually, he renounced the project in order not to demoralize Constantinople's people who had placed in him the, their last hopes. Having conquered the Balkans and large areas of Anatolia, the enemy had almost surrounded the capital. But the problems faced by Heraclius were not simply military ones. The financial situation of the empire had marked the end of a defense system based on mercenary troops. Winning a few battles was not sufficient to save the empire. This goal required a profound administrative reform, a long-term project that had to be carried out, unfortunately, while the war with Persia raged and the enemies were advancing. However, Heraclius succeeded in this extraordinarily difficult task. He reformed the Byzantine system in the Near East by bringing it closer to the model of the Exarchates, which he knew very well. The time had come to drop the organizational model dating back to Diocletian, based on the separation of the civil administration from the military one. The survival of the empire required a militarization of the society. Therefore, Heraclius divided the Byzantine territory into um, military districts called themes from the Greek thema meaning military settlement. Each theme was governed by a military commander, the strategos. The soldiers of each theme received the land ownership in exchange for an inheritable military service obligation. For the rest, the pay was low. If a family failed to provide a soldier to the theme and did not replace him when he retired or died, it lost entitlement to the land. This organization would last for centuries. Uh, by his reform, Heraclius managed to entrench in Anatolia a population that had both the willingness and the training to resist the Persian invasions. He was no longer hostage of costly and untrustworthy mercenaries. Furthermore, this system allowed him to exploit the demographic pressure exercised by the Slavs. Heraclius started to enlist Slavic soldiers and relocate them in Anatolia. By distributing land in exchange for military service, he reinforced the army without ruining the empire's finances. In the meantime, he had been borrowing time. In 619, he bought an onerous piece from the Khan of the Avars the Avers, in order to prepare for confronting Casro. In order to do that, Heraclius set up to do something very unusual for an Eastern Roman emperor, to lead personally the military operation. He appointed an underage son as co-emperor and left the joint regency to one of his generals and to Sergius, the Patriarch of Constantinople. It was a risky step, but it, but it helped Heraclius to mobilize the church in what became, in fact, the first holy war of the Middle Ages. In the meantime, the Sassanid Empire had reached the peak of its might. The war against the Byzantines had led to substantial territorial gains. In 611, the Persians had captured important cities like Caesarea, Edessa, and Antioquia, where 
Heraclius had suffered a defeat by the Sassanid generals. In 613, also Damascus and Homs had fallen. Furthermore, Sassanid armies had retaken Armenia, a region that included the northeastern portion of what is now Turkey. In 614, the Persians conquered Jerusalem, where they seized the true cross, the most precious relic of Christianity, which they carried to Ctesiphon as a trophy. In 615, a Persian army reached once again the Bosphorus, site of Constantinople. In 619, even Egypt, the granary of the Roman Empire, fell into the hands of Hasroh. At that point, the Sassanid Empire extended for almost 7 million square kilometers from Egypt to Afghanistan and to the Indus Valley. The most prosperous region of the ancient world, the Fertile Crescent, stretching from the Nile Delta to Mesopotamia, was again under Persian control, as it had been at the time of the Achaemenid kings over 900 years before. Against this overwhelming power, Heraclius, after using the last financial resources, among which the church treasures, to avert again an assault of the Avers on Constantinople, started a counter-offensive in 622. In preparation of it, Heraclius had elaborated a new strategy based on developing the cavalry and the army's mobility in general. After spending a few months in Anatolia to train the troops of the Thebes, Heraclius launched an expedition into western Armenia. He imposed his initiative to the Persians and managed to defeat them in a major battle. He could have profited from this victory, but he had to rush back to Constantinople, again under the threat of the Avers. Once more, Heraclius borrowed time by increasing the tributes to the Khan and by offering some of his relatives as hostages. In 623, the Avers eventually left. The day of reckoning with them had been only postponed. In 624, Heraclius was back to Armenia, decided to play his cards by relying on mobile warfare. Instead of wearing out his army by retaking Armenia bit by bit, Heraclius, with a move of great audacity, thrusted very deeply into the enemy's territory. The enemy was taken by surprise. Before the Persian generals could catch up, the Byzantine army reached one of the most sacred places of Zoroastrianism, the Fire Temple in Ganzak, built 400 years before by Ardashir, founder of the Sasanian dynasty. In retaliation for the destruction of churches in Jerusalem, the Byzantine set fire to the great temple complex. Heraclius had penetrated into the heartland of the Sasanian Empire, in a region located southeast of the lake of Lake Urmia, where nobody had expected to see Roman troops. It was an astonishing coup de théâtre in a war which had seen uh, the Persians constantly on the offensive for two decades, conquering new territories uh, every year. Hosro reacted by sending troops from distant locations to intercept Heraclius, who managed to beat one of these uncoordinated armies. By then, however, the winter was approaching, and in the cold and arid region of western Iran, cavalry troops had to stop their operations for lack of forage. The Byzantines therefore could winter uh, safely, and in the spring of 625, thanks to their superior mobility, they set about to return. After a long itinerary in hostile territories, Heraclius managed to regain Anatolia, pursued in vain by the Sassanid armies. At this point, however, Hasro Parwiz, disappeared means meant victorious, had become aware of the danger. He sent his generals for the final offensive. In 626, while Heraclius moved north and reached the Black Sea near the Caucasus, the Persian army traversed the entire length of the Anatolian peninsula 
and reached the Bosphorus, where it camped inside of Constantinople. In order to leave no escape to the city, the Persian general Sharbaraz had secured an alliance with the Khan of the Avars, of the Avars, who gathered hordes of Avars, Slavs, Gepids, and Bulgars under the western wall of Constantinople. The city had been surrounded on all sides. The nightmare of a combined assault of its enemies had finally materialized. During a carefully orchestrated meeting, the Khan, in presence of Persian ambassadors, described to a Byzantine delegation the only possible outcome of the siege. Unless each citizen gave himself up to the Persian wearing not more than a single tunic and a cloak, there was no way the citizens could escape unless they could turn themselves into birds or fishes. The capital was still guarded by formidable fortifications or, and by the Byzantine fleet. The people of Constantinople, galvanized by the Patriarch Sergius, managed to resist the assault of the Ava Hordes. The Byzantine fleet, on the other hand, achieved a major success by setting fire to the countless boats of the Slavs, which were about to ferry the Persian troops across the Bosphorus for the final assault to the city. The Khan, having lost any hope to take the city, had to negotiate the truce in order to dismantle his siege engines and carry them away. The Persians, on the other side of the Bosphorus, retreated as well. The failure of the siege resulted in a fatal blow to the Avars prestige in the Balkans. Soon the Slavs would challenge them and establish their first empire in the peninsula, followed by the Bulgars. The Avars would never gather again before the gates of Constantinople. The memory of their empire would soon fade forever into oblivion. During the siege, Heraclius had remained literally a thousand miles away to the east of the Black Sea, in the region that is now Georgia. He had closed an alliance with a Turkish Khanate, which occupied the western portion of the boundless steppes that stretch from the Caspian Sea to China. This Turkish population was deeply hostile, both to the Persians and to the Avars, who had dominated them before moving to Pannonia. In the Caucasus, Heraclius received important reinforcement of Turkish archers. They rode small horses grown in the Central Asian steppes, where the climate is subject to extreme temperature ranges, and they were accustomed to browse in spite of the winter frost. With them, in the autumn of the year 627, Heraclius took another audacious initiative, a long-range incursion into enemy territory in winter when the Persian troops were not prepared to fight. The Sassanid general had not expected such a move. From the Caucasus, Heraclius went straight south, reaching what is now northern Iraq, moving quickly, leaving Persian armies constantly behind. Finally, as the Byzantine soldiers approached Nineveh on a, on a foggy morning, Heraclius suddenly ordered to turn against the tide tailgating enemy. The Byzantine cavalry plunged with great impetus on the bewildered uh, Persian troops and routed them. Immediately thereafter, Heraclius rushed downstream along the Tigris towards Tesiphon, which was not very far away. Hosro did not have the time to wait for reinforcement. His armies were much too distant from the Persian capital. While Heraclius captured the kings of kings' lavish palaces one after the other, Hosro narrowly managed to escape from his favorite re residence of Dastagerd, where the Byzantines found treasures and hundreds of exotic animals for the monarch's hunts. In Tesiphon, Hosro started to organize a hopeless defense of his capital. 
But at this point, many Persian aristocrats now fear for their own lives and had had enough of a king unable to come to terms with reality. Hasro the Victorious paid dearly for his hubris. He was deposed and executed by his own son, Chavad, who killed his own half-brother first. By a strange twist of fate, the war ended with the same barbarous act that had started it 26 years before. A father executed after his own children. The thought of this atrocity was certainly vivid for Chavad, who had been previously imprisoned by Hasro. He was the son of Maurice's daughter, the first wife of Hasro. Unlike his foe, Heraclius knew when to stop. Instead of conquering Tesiphon, he moved his army to another town and started peace negotiation with Havad, who, in 629, signed a peace treaty by which the Byzantine regained all the territories lost during the long war. Shortly afterwards, Havad also died, and General Sharbaraz ascended to the throne with the support of the Byzantines. While Heraclius returned triumphantly to Constantinople, acclaimed as the rescuer of Christianity, Shabraz carried out the withdrawal of the Persian army from Cappadocia, from Syria, Palestine, from Egypt. In 630, Heraclius re-entered Jerusalem with a true cross, returned by Shabraz. The Sassanid Empire had been fatally wounded, and it soon slid into civil war. It will finally collapse about 20 years later, as we will see in one of the next lectures. Starting from a seemingly hopeless situation, Heraclius had managed to defeat the superpower of his time, together with other redoubtable enemies. He had led some of the most daring campaigns of all times, which, because of the effectiveness of mobile warfare, remind us of the first phase of World War II, of the Blitzkrieg. The monarch of India sent congratulations to Heraclius, while the Frankish king Dagobert hurried to sign an eternal peace treaty with him. Yet, these extraordinary events were soon going to be surpassed by even more spectacular and unpredictable ones. A huge wave was about to sweep the Middle East and the Mediterranean. In the next lecture, we will talk about the birth of Islam. For now, thank you for your interest and see you soon.